management of a heart attack in the acute setting, a &E setting in a hospital, how do we manage whether it's STEMI or non-STEMI? Let's move forward. So first and foremost, patient comes in presenting you with the path and mnemonic signs of a myocardial infarction. So your central chest pain, central crushing, uh, retrosternal, impending doom, diaphoresis, perhaps an element of nausea, vomiting. Okay. How do we go about this? How do we manage it? Let's go from here. First and foremost, let's go with nail by mouth. Why are we going to assume or otherwise we need to consider whether this patient might need a PCI if it's a STEMI? Before we do the PCI, what we need to, uh, before we do the uh, nail by mouth, we need to identify the patient in pain. Um, if they are in pain, what, what do we do? We ask them how severe the pain is. The severity of the pain, 0 to 10, 0 being no pain, 10 being absolutely excruciating pain. That scale that a lot of practitioners use is, is actually called the VAS, the Visual Analog Scale. It's used in clinical practice very widely and accepted as being kind of normal, although it actually carries no diagnostic value per se. Very subjective but also, and that's part of the reason. Keeping to the point, let's say the patient is 8 to 9 out of 10, we're going to offer them analgesia. Before we actually give the analgesia, what we're going to identify, do you have any allergies? If there are no allergies, then absolutely let's move forward with the lack of morphine. So we'll administer some morphine. Great. Um, don't forget, if the patient has come in with the paramedics, there's uh, quite a possibility that they've been given some uh, medications. Let's assume they haven't, so they've not had anything here. We're going to then give them some aspirin, 300 milligrams as well. 75 milligrams is your daily dose, that's your antiplatelet. Of course, aspirin is an antiplatelet, that's more maintenance dose, 300 milligrams is partially what we would classify as a bit of a loading dose as well, as well as a, a strong analgesic. If the patient is allergic to aspirin, we're going to give them properly a grill. Okay, so bear in mind that. Sticking an O2 SATS monitor, check that blood pressure, etc. The O2 SATS you need to say, okay, again, everything are based on trust policy, so just take everything with a pinch of salt and make sure you're familiar with the trust policy. 94% or less, we're going to oxygen every patient, offer some oxygen, prescribe it, offer it. Don't forget, you need to be mindful if the patient has a background of COPD, there may be O2 retainers, therefore 88 to 92% of the target SATs. We're going to then candidate the patient because we're going to need to do that uh, along the way. Why? Part of the reason is because we're going to need some bloods. But before we want the bloods, the other medication we can administer or offer are nitrates, sublingual nitrates, so glycerol trinitrate. Uh, remember, nitrates are vasodilators. What they do is uh, essentially increase the amount of blood flow to the area and therefore we reduce the oxygen respiratory demand from the myocardium, thus reducing the pain as well. Think to bear in mind with the nitrates. First time if a patient is, is uh, nitrate naive, if they've never had any nitrates in the past, then they're going to let, be left most likely with a pounding headache. So just please be sure to warn them of that. You've done the aspirin, you've done the nitrates, you've done the oxygen, you've done the morphine. Okay, let's move on then. We're going to um, take some bloods. Bloods uh, taken at zero hours and at 12 hours in truth some policies. Some trusts refer to say four to six hours. Personally, it's four to six hours. What we're looking for particularly is a trop tease. Okay, then a trop eyes and trop tease. Trop tease is a marker that we use in this particular trust. And what we're looking for, as much as an elevation, we're looking for a dynamic rise. Okay, so dynamic rise, what you're after. Now, dynamic rise, what do we mean by dynamic change? Varies from consultant to consultant, 30% to 50% dynamic change. Thing to bear in mind if it's mildly elevated and you see that dynamic rise group we've got a case to you know consider here for mi if however there's no dynamic rise but the the, the actual uh, value is significantly higher than it ought to be in the given context then we still will treat it as an mi and, and this is a point important uh, to note any presentation not just mi or in the given setting any presentation we need to contextualize then we take a single investigation on its own as a given as a, a, a and use this as a um as a, as a marker or otherwise tool to indicate something is going on never it doesn't happen okay, everything in context so with the trop tees what's also a uh, good practice to measure is pro bmp i appreciate pro bmp has nothing to do with mi per se but uh, it's a collateral but it does absolutely have everything to do with heart failure and it's absolutely worth checking that while we're there remember BMP, pro BMP, normal value less than 400, 400 to 2000, you're considering cardiology referral, anything in excess of 2000, and that's within its time set skills. 
anything in excess of 2000 and it's an immediate referral to cardiology okay um the other thing we'll measure here is the coagulation cascade okay so pt ptt and i and i and particularly if it's greater than 1.5 then you've got an increased risk of bleeding so don't forget we're just giving aspirin 75 milligram uh 300 milligrams so we've got clopidic grow and the lights over there so front of is probably going to be used moving forward as well um so we need to be mindful of this um the other things that you could throw in with the bloods full blood count hba once in lipid profile uh, this is more kind of move forward a little bit rather than the acute setting in its entirety why because this will help us to understand whether the mi was a primary or a secondary mi as well as helping us to inform moving forward uh, when we're doing the management remember we're going to refer the patient on a geography and if they've if they're on if they're diabetic then we need to stop the morphine for the renal clearance and we also need to assess in the given situation we also need to assess the user needs the renal function Basically, if that's compromised, then again, we can't refer for contrast dye uh, CT scan. Then we might need to actually, uh, contrast dye angiography, we might need to consider doing an MPSMI cardioperfusion scan. So using these are quite an important one to throw in there. And then your know, LFTs and all that, obviously, that comes in, but these are very much the more important ones. So once you've done that, let's then move on and, and do an ECG on the patient. Again, this is important. Why we need to determine whether this is STEMI or a non-STEMI. Non-STEMI. What we're going to see so just to remind us of the territories on the ecg you've got leads two three avf that's the inferior mi that's uh, corresponds to the uh, right coronary artery the v1 v2 generally the anterior aspect of the, the septum uh, itself the v3 v, uh, v3 v4 the septum so v1 to v4 generally comes in together that's your anterior septal that's the led the left anterior descending artery also known as a widow maker and then you've got your V5, V6 and lead uh, one at the top. And that generally is your la left circumflex artery referring to a lateral MI. So in order of incidence, it's the LED followed by the RC and followed by the left circumflex. So that's generally how they go. And it's not at all proportional either. Um, so a significantly larger proportion of them is the LED near 70 to 80 percent, depending on what reference you refer to. So in the uh, non stemmy what we're going to see is the uh, flattening of T-waves and uh, moving forward, what you'll see is uh, an inversion. So by the next day, you'll see TVIs or TWIs, T-wave inversions. And that, those inversions or flattening will reflect the territory of the myocardium that's been affected. Let's go to the STEMI. Let's say, OK, we've got an ST elevation. Remember, uh, it needs to meet the criteria, and don't forget the ST elevation needs to be in two consecutive leads. Um, never again one lead on its own. Um, in those situations, what we need to do is we need to refer for a PCI, a primary, a, a, a percutaneous coronary intervention, which um, again includes all your angiography, angioplasty, etc. That should be done ideally within 120 minutes, i.e. within two hours. We're going to also consider thrombolysis and we need to consider thrombolyzing the patient within 12 hours of the onset of chest pain. Not the ons uh, not within um, 12 hours of presentation, but more so the onset of chest pain itself. The ideal time frame to actually do this is within six hours, but the optimum, the optimum is actually four hours. So thrombolyze the patient within four hours of the onset of chest pain is your, uh, your optimum, ideally within six hours. <coughs> and otherwise, we want to do that. <coughs> Excuse me, we need to do that within 12 hours. Bear in mind if the patient has been brought in by the paramedics, the paramedics may well have already given the antiplatelet therapy, i.e., the aspirin 300 milligrams, and they may well have also given the patient some um, retoplates or tenecteplates. Um, when they arrive in hospital, you've cannulated the patient, you're then going to consider IV infusion of either streptokinase or ortoplase. Ortoplase is used most of the streptokinase, and the reason being uh, it's a better side effect profile. Um, so that's what we're going to while in hospital. Here we also obviously then need to consider the nail down front of that discussed right on the outside. So there you are, my friends. That's your um, acute management of a myocardial infarction, be it STEMI or non-STEMI, and everything that we're going to do with the patient in your typical acute e, &E setting. Thank you for watching.